we're beginning a new series today called Love Expressed. We're going to talk about worship for four weeks. Love Expressed. And this first message, I want to go really all the way back to the beginning of worship. And the title is, What is Church? What is church? What, what is a worship experience? What does God expect when we say we're going to have church? Or what should you expect when you attend church? Now, obviously, what we're going to talk about this truth, it can be uh, in your quiet time, at any time you can have church with God. But there is something that happens when we come together as a body on the weekends and have church. So I want to go back to what it means to come to the house of God, all right, and to talk about worship. Genesis 28, this is a little bit of a long story, but I want you to stay with me because everything in this story is very, very important to us. Genesis 28, beginning in verse 10. Genesis 28, verse 10. Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. I'll explain to you the, the distance between these, these two cities later because it's important. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place. Now watch the symbolism. Think about Jesus as the cornerstone, the headstone, the chief stone. He took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head. And he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven. In other words, a way to get from earth to heaven. So that represents I was going to say something, but it represents someone. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it, bringing answers to prayer, interacting with earth. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, to the north and to the south. It's important he uses all these directions. Again, I'll tell you why later. And in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I've done what I've spoken to you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. The, the New Living Translation says the gateway, and this is an important verse to us as in the naming of our church. Then Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone which he had put at his head, set it up as a pillar, watch the symbolism, and poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, which means house of God. But the name of that city had been Luz previously. I'll tell you what Luz means later. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God will be with me and keep me in this way that I'm going and give me bread to eat and clothing to put on, protect me and provide for me, he's saying, so that I come back to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. And this stone which I've set as a pillar shall be God's house. This is the beginning of the church, actually. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth to you. Now, you, you knew I'd get tithing in here somewhere. <laughs> okay. This is the, the, this is the birth of the church. We say Acts chapter 2 is the birth of the church, but I really believe it's the birth of the New Testament church. This is the birth of the house of God. Beth meaning house, like Beth Shalom, house of peace, uh, Bethlehem, house of bread. Beth, meaning house, and El, Elohim, God. This is, this is the house of God. This is what he says. This is the house of God. Okay, what made that the house of God? And what makes this the house of God? And what makes this the house of God? Our own bodies. What, what makes it the house of God? Um, Bethel was a, a place... Uh, a, a little portion of this city Luz, and uh, it was where springs were. Uh, so it was a good place to camp. That's all it was before this happened. It was just a good place to camp. Abraham had built an altar there years before. And actually, it says Abraham built an altar at Bethel 
But it wasn't called Bethel then, it was called Luz, because we know that from Genesis 28. And you have to think, well then why then in Genesis 12 is it, is it called Bethel? It's because Moses wrote the first five books of the Old Testament and he didn't live until years later after this, about 400 years after this. And so he's writing, so he knows it's known as Bethel. He says Abraham went to Bethel, but it was not called Bethel until this, till Jacob named it. Jamed, Jacob named it Bethel, but it had been known previously as Luz, all right? It was also the major uh, north-south highway went through Bethel, Bethel, Luz, and it went through, the east-west went through there as well. And he said, you're gonna, your descendants are going to spread out from here, north and south, east and west. This was the major crossroad of the promised land of Israel in Bethel. Bethel is, is the second most mentioned city in Israel in the Bible other than Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the first. And it's, it's the first by a long way, but Bethel is the second. So what, what, what is it? What, why, why was this? Why would he say this is the house of God? Which is church, all right? So let me give you three, three points, all right? Number one, church is a connection. It, church is a connection. It is a place where we connect with God. If you don't connect with God when you come to church, if, if, you, if you just hear uh, uh, good music and good teaching, well, let's be honest, great teaching. <laughs> if you just hear great music and great teaching, you, and you don't connect with God, you didn't go to church. Jacob makes a connection with God. Verse 12 says, he dreamed and behold a ladder was set up on the earth. Its top reached to heaven and there the angels of God were ascending and descending on. Now many, many scriptures in the Old Testament have a New Testament confirmation of what this was. It tells us what it was. Um, this happens when Philip goes to his brother Nathaniel and he says, I found the Messiah. I have found the Son of God. You, you need to come and see. So Nathaniel gets up, and, and I don't know, it doesn't seem like he's real excited about it. Maybe Philip had, had lots of spiritual experiences or something before. And so he's walking, and he's, he's approaching Jesus. Jesus says to, about Nathaniel, behold an Israelite in whom there is no guile. And Nathaniel is probably the, the more reserved, quiet one, you know, and the more thinking one, and it just shocks him. And he says, do you know me? How do you, how do you know that about me? And Jesus said, oh, Nathaniel, I've known you, you know, your whole life. He said, I, I saw you when you were sitting under the fig tree when Philip came and told you that he'd found the Messiah. And Nathaniel says, truly, you are the son of God. And Jesus says to him, I like what he said, and I'm going to give, me, give you my version of it. He said, you, you, you think I'm the son of God because I said I saw you sitting under a fig tree? And then he says this, fasten your seatbelt. <laughs> If you think that is going to show you on the Son of God, just wait till you see in the next few years, okay? But then he makes this statement, verse 51, and he, John 1, 51, and he said to him, most assuredly I say to you, hereafter you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Okay, every Israelite knew Jacob's ladder. Jacob's ladder. As a matter of fact, there are people who don't even go to church today who know about Jacob's ladder. And here's what Jesus says, I'm the ladder. I'm Jacob's ladder. You know about the ladder where the angels ascend and descend from, from heaven to earth and back from earth to heaven. And he said, you're gonna see that happening. You're gonna see them going up and down on me. In other words, I'm the, if you wanna know how to get from earth to heaven, I'm how you get there. So there's a connection that is made between heaven and earth and his name is Jesus. But again, now why is this church, all right? Verse 16 says of Genesis 28, Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, now watch closely this sentence, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. Okay, now, um, in, in my family, I'm, I'm asked by my family members many, many times to read things that they've written. Um, uh, uh, all of my kids are in the ministry, so they'll teach at some point or speak somewhere. Debbie will speak, or she'll write an article or something, or my daughter who's in the university will write a paper, you know. So I'm, I'm asked to, to read things, you know, often. And um, Debbie will say to me, um, now, I'm asking you to read this for the content. I don't want you to look at the grammar, okay? 
I want you to tell me, is this theologically correct? Is this the best way to say it? Help me to arrange it. My daughter asked me this. Is this correct theologically so I can turn this into the university and things like this? But Debbie will say, don't, don't look at the grammar. And I'll be reading through and she's kind of sitting there. And in a moment, I'll just say to her, I have to correct the grammar. <laughs> and she said, I just want you to see the content. I said, I can't see the content <laughs> until I make it readable. It's like, I, said, I can't, you can't end this sentence with a preposition. You just, 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 you know, it's okay. All right, so grammar jumps out at me without me trying to make it jump out, okay? So let me tell you why I'm saying that. When I read this verse the first time, it jumped out at me because it is not grammatically correct. <laughs> now, there are a few of you that when we read it a moment ago, it jumped out to you. There, there are probably three in a, in a crowd this size, okay? But there's not many, but it jumps out because it begins in the present. Surely the Lord is right now in this place. And I did not know it ends in the past. I mean, the sentence begins in the present, ends in the past. Okay, listen, to me. you can't do that. And for my family, you can't do that, okay? You can't, your sentence can't do that. Okay, now, now I'm, I'm, I'm saying this tongue-in-cheek, obviously, because it's the Bible, okay? It's theologically correct. And, and actually, I can remember thinking, well, why, would, why would the Lord say it that way? The Lord knows grammar. You know, why would the Lord say it that way? <laughs> and I think he wants us to understand something that is so important. If you don't get anything out of the message, I want you to get this. Here's what Jacob was saying. Surely the Lord is in this place. He is, he was, and he is, he still is in this place. And I did not know it, but I know it now. The Lord's here, and I didn't know it, but now I know it. Okay, if, if you want it, please, and this is one of the things I'd love for you to write the statement out or memorize the statement, church is becoming aware of the presence of God. That's what church is. When you come to church somewhere during a song, during a point in the message, someone, when, when, when one of the pastors gives a word from the Lord, a little exhortation in, in worship or something, somewhere in there, all of a sudden, you become aware of the presence of God. You got to remember, God's everywhere. God's everywhere. But what happens when we have church is when we become aware of his presence. We're going, this can happen when we're going through a difficult time. This can happen in your quiet time. This can happen going down the road. This can happen listening to a worship city. This can happen in a hospital room. You just all of a sudden know God's here. Okay, that's church. That's the difference. And if you ever attend a service and you don't sense God's presence, now listen, listen, don't blame it on the church. Because in the deadest, driest, boringest church, God is still there. It depends on whether you make a connection. And, and, and I don't want you to ever come to church and just watch the show, okay? Church is not about exhibiting God, it's about experiencing God. We are not trying to put on a good show at Gateway Church. We are trying to create an atmosphere so every person can have an encounter with God. Whether you just got saved or you haven't come to know the Lord yet or you've been saved 40 years, we try to create an atmosphere so that every person somewhere says, oh God, you're here. Surely the Lord is in this place. And I didn't know it, but I know it now. So number one, church is a connection. Here's number two, church is a conversation. Church is a conversation. Once you connect with God, he wants to talk to you. 
He wants to tell you something, and he wants you to respond. Notice God spoke to Jacob, and Jacob spoke to God. That's church. If you, if you don't connect with God, you didn't go to church. And if you don't have a conversation with him, if you don't talk to him and hear him, you didn't go to church. Church is the house of God is where God lives and God speaks. When, when God spoke to Moses to build the tabernacle, this is what he said to him, Exodus 25, 22, and there I will meet with you and I will speak with you. That's church. I'm gonna meet with you, I'm gonna connect with you, and I'm gonna speak with you. We're gonna have a conversation. Now, I wanna give you three ways that God could speak during church, and very often does, but, but there are many, many ways, obviously, that God speaks. And I want to, I want to, uh, uh, I want to give you a, uh, show you something on the board. For those of you that haven't seen me with the whiteboard, I'm a great colorer. I have been a great colorer since uh, kindergarten. Okay. You you will be fascinated by what I'm doing here in just a moment. This is an intersection in a small town. Okay. Um. And we could just put up here so everyone will remember, church is a, number one, what? Connection. And church is number two, conversation. So I want you to remember these things. Okay, now, um, here's a way that God might speak. Let me give you an A, two A, all right? Uh, Correction. Now, here's the reason I actually wanted to start with this. I think the Lord wanted to start with this because this way he gave it to me is um, correction is not bad. It's a good thing. Okay, this is an intersection. Uh, North, uh, some of you will recognize this sign. North, east, south, west. This is actually the, never mind. Okay, so, so let's say that over here outside of town is um, a festival. And this town is known for this festival, all right? And so a car, here comes a car. This is the car. Okay? And, and the car comes into town and the car turns this way. It's going this way. It's going the wrong direction, right? And so there's a guy here that lives in town and he sees them and he starts waving. This is the international symbol for waving. Okay, and so they stop and he says to him, hey, um, I notice you're, you're, you have out-of-state license plates and I know this is the time of our festival, our production, and people come from all over and um, I, I just wanna know, are you in town for that? They say, yes, we're in town and, and we wanna get there early so we can get good seats. We've heard so much about it. We wanna see the opening ceremony. And he says, well, if, if you're trying to get there early and you're, that's where you're going, I just need to let you know you're going in the wrong direction. You should be going that way. You need to turn around and go that way. Okay, now let me ask you something about this guy. Is this a bad guy? Is he mean? No. As a matter of fact, he's their friend. Please hear me. When God says to you, you're going in the wrong direction, the relationship you're in is not going to take you where you want to go. It's the wrong direction. What what if the family says, but we like this direction, it's really pretty. We really like it. The guy would say, well, that's fine, it is pretty this way. It's just not gonna get you to your destiny. It's not gonna get you, you're not gonna make it. Okay, so there's nothing wrong with God speaking correction into our lives. God only does it for our good. So when you're in worship, it's very, very common that the Lord says in this area of your life, you're going in the wrong direction, okay? so. Uh, Correction, he'll speak correction. Here's, here's 2B, he'll speak direction. Now here's what I mean by direction because you think, well he just spoke direction. No, that was correction, okay? Uh, let's say that this family comes into town and they're right there stopped at the intersection and, and they all have their iPhones out and they're trying to get directions to this uh, festival but it's a small town, they don't have a website, and, um, uh, and they have a ba- bad service on top of that, okay? So 
and obviously no one cares a map or an atlas anymore, so since they all have iPhones. So, so they're on the corner and they're just frantically trying to figure out which way do I turn, which way do I go? And this guy is now standing, he's just standing on the corner, and so he waves, remember the international signal? Okay, so he waves and he says, hey, hey, I noticed you guys looking on your iPhones. That happens a lot See, when people come into this town and they can't get service. I was wondering, are you going to the um, festival? And they say, yes, we're going. Do you know where it is? He says, yes. All you have to do is turn left and just, you, you just run right into it. There's just no way you can miss it. Okay, what's wrong with that? That's what the Lord wants to do. And let me ask you this, very simple. How many times do you need, do you need direction? How many times do you need to know which way to go, which job to take, where to put your kids in the school, if you should buy this house or not? How, do you, how many times do we need to know this? All the time, right? So you come into the presence of God, and when you're in the presence of God, you make a connection with him, and God speaks something in your life. And he might say to you, you're going in the wrong direction. You need to turn around. But he might say to you, you know what you've been asking me about? You need to go this way. You need to go this way. So he'll speak direction. And, and then 2C is inspiration. Now, here's what I mean by that, all right? Let's say that the, the, uh, the family comes into town, and they turn this way, and they're going this way, and they see a, a sign over here, a great big sign that says, festival ahead. What's that do? Just inspires them to keep going. You know, have you ever, you ever been driving and you know that it's on this street, but you think, surely I would have passed it by now? You know, surely I would have gotten there? And then you see a sign that says, one mile ahead. It inspires you. You, you don't stop. You don't turn around. See, they didn't, they don't, because they see the sign, it inspires them to keep going. Listen, God loves to give us signs along the way that inspire us to keep going. Keep going the way you're going. You're doing well. Let me just give you one very obvious one. You are my beloved son and whom I am well pleased. And you think, well, you're sure he'd say that to Jesus. He'd say that to you too. You're my beloved daughter. I'm very pleased you're doing great. You're going through a tough time right now, but you're going great. I love what you're doing right now. Just keep going this way. That's exactly what God wants to do. God wants to show up every time we gather together. Now, he wants to show up in your quiet time, uh, your car, when you're praying, all those as well. But especially, listen, when we come together in corporate worship, I want every person not to just attend a service. I want every person to make a connection and have a conversation with God. By the way, I use the analogy of a um, small town. Um, I was just thinking about this in the preparation, and I've said this many times, because sometimes it seems like Gateway Church is so big, I just can't, so big, and please listen to me. That's just, it's just a lie of the enemy, that it's so big I can't connect. That's a lie of the enemy. It's a lie of the enemy. And so I've used the analogy before. I've said, we're not a big church. We're a small town. We're, we're about the size of a small town. And in a small town, you know most people. And you recognize their faces. And you might not be able to say their name, but you say, oh, yeah, I know, I know that person. And, you get, and then even in a small town, there are groups and organizations that you get involved in, and you meet more people, and you feel more like family. Listen, it's a lie that a large church can't have a family atmosphere. It's a lie from the enemy. I know some small churches that don't have family atmospheres. Well, they do, but everyone in the family is fighting. <laughs> you, 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 a small church can have a very healthy family atmosphere or a dead atmosphere, and a large church can be healthy or unhealthy. So it's not the quantity of the people that makes the difference. It's the quality. So I want you to know, if, if you're new here, and don't, don't because some people say, I just, I just don't, it's just too big for me. No, it's not too big for you. To just think of it as a, we're, we're just a small town in a big city. And you can live in this small town called Gateway Church and get to know a whole lot of people. And you can bring people from the big city that don't know anybody into the small town also.
So, number one, church is a, a connection. Number two, church is a conversation. Here's number three, uh, church is a commitment. Church is a commitment. Jacob makes a commitment. It says, then Jacob made a vow. He made a commitment to God when God spoke. That this is church. When God speaks, we have to make a commitment. For instance, again, just use the analogy. What if the, this family, if they take the first one, if they're going the wrong way, and he says you need to turn around, what do they have to do? They have to make a commitment. <laughs> and they have to fulfill that commitment to get to their destiny, right? If, if they're, if they're um, um, staying right here and he says you gotta turn left, they've gotta fulfill the commitment to turn left and go that way. If they're actually going the way that they're supposed to be going, they have to, to fulfill the commitment to keep going and not pull over and stop or not turn off on a side road. Or, or, or they'll never get to where they're going. And that's what God wants. And I want you to notice something about this commitment because this commitment's really, really uh, strange and incredible. Um, he does something that only his grandfather had done before then. He said, I'm gonna give a tenth to you. I'm, I'm going to tithe. I'm going to give the first 10% of my income to you. Now, the only one who'd ever done that that we know about before in the Bible was, was uh, Abraham. By the way, again, remember, Abraham built an altar at Bethel. He had an encounter with God, and Abraham said, I'm going to give you a tenth. Can I just say something just lovingly? Any true commitment will always involve your wallet. It's, it's never, ever, ever a true commitment if it doesn't involve your wallet. Listen, you, you can go shopping and you can look and look and look and look, but you never commit until your wallet gets involved. It gets real quiet when you talk about money in church, doesn't it? <laughs> Do you know why? Please hear my heart on this. Most of you know me well enough. Do you know why so many people make a commitment to start going to church and straighten up, especially in January, and why so many people fall away from their commitment? Listen, it's very simple. They're not invested. It is that simple. Because Matthew 6, 21 says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, there are many people that misquote that verse. They say, you know, the Bible says where your heart is, there your treasure will be also. It doesn't say that. It says where your treasure is, there your heart will be. In other words, your heart follows your treasure. So if you won't, to your heart to be in the house of God and your heart to be after the things of God and your heart to follow hard after God. Put your treasure there and your heart will start going. I promise you. You, you invest in a stock, you'll start getting on the internet and checking that stock, see how it's doing, and you never cared before how that stock did. But you know why you care about it now? Because part of your heart's there. You know why your heart's there? Because your treasure's there. P please hear me, please hear me. This is a great time. First of the year, we're making commitments. Make a commitment, put God first in your life this year. And the way you do it is you begin investing in the kingdom of God. And what happens is, see, so many people say, I hear about people and they talk about how they love God. I wish I loved God like that. Listen, start tithing. I'm telling you, just try. I've told, again, I've told the whole church, I've told the church for years, you tithe for a year. If you're not fully satisfied, I'll give you your money back. I'll make that money back guarantee again for the two, year 2013. Tithe for a year. If you're not fully satisfied at the end of that year, I'll give your money back. You, you know, do you know why I can make that commitment? Because God's word says that if you'll tithe, I will open the windows of heaven and pour out such blessing on you, you will not be able to receive it. In other words, you'll get to give more. And, and, you know, like if you call right now, And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes. Can you imagine? You don't have to stand in a room yelling at the devil. God yells at the devil for you. If you just tithe. It's, fan, it's fantastic. It's wonderful. Isn't it? Think about it. God's saying, no, you can't touch him. He's a tither. Hey, just from a business standpoint, that's worth 10%. Okay, let me, let me finish with this. Um, why is he going from Beersheba to Haran? Let me tell you where these cities are. Beersheba is the southern city on the southern border of Israel. Okay, in other words, you, you cross into Israel, you're in Beersheba. 
okay, southernmost city. Haran is right across the border on the northern part of Israel. In other words, um, um, the uh, Beersheba is Harlingen or Corpus Christi, Texas. Haran is Canada. Okay, it's right on the other border, okay. Why is he going from Beersheba to Haran? Why is he trying to get as far away as he can? Actually, even to another country now. It's not even in the promised land. It's right on the other border. Haran is where Tehran, who was Abraham's father, stopped before he came into the promised land. That's where he stopped and camped, okay, and built his home there. Why is he doing this? Well, it's because Jacob, his actual name means a liar, a supplanter, a deceiver, a manipulator. That's what his name means. And he's been supplanting his, his older brother Esau his whole life. And so he's this supplanter, he's this deceiver, he's this manipulator, he's this person who's got to work out everything, even to this point. Now, here's the reason, here's the reason that he's going on this trip, because he has just manipulated his father into giving him the blessing of the oldest son, the firstborn son, which is Esau, which means twice the inheritance. So if the inheritance was 300,000, Esau would have gotten 200,000 and Jacob 100,000. He manipulated and he got the 200,000. He got, you see what I'm saying? He got the other part. He got his father to give him that. He, and he dressed up, he, uh, Esau was real hairy and he was a hunter, an outdoorsman, and he went out to hunt to get some wild game for his dad and, and his mother connived with him, Jacob's mother, and they dressed him up in an animal skin and he went in, his dad was old and he couldn't see well and they may put animals so he'd smell like a hunter and he felt of him and he said, are you Esau? Because your voice sounds like Jacob. He said, no, I'm Esau, I just lied to him. And so, Esau, so uh, Isaac gave him his blessing and he gives him his blessing and then Esau comes home and finds out about it, and he makes this just really, just, just a, a very, uh, you know, a loving statement. He says, I'm going to kill him. <laughs> now, here's the problem. Esau was a hunter. He was very good at tracking and killing wild animals, okay? He, so, so when someone who's good at badminton says they're going to kill you, okay, you don't have to worry as much. <laughs> but, but when someone who, who knows how to stalk and who, and he said, I'm going to kill you. So he goes to his mom and says, Mom, what do I do? She says, uh, run for your life, son. Uh, get, go to Canada. Get as far away from here as possible, okay? And we have relatives in, in Canada, and it's where your father and your grandfather found their wives. Okay, so here's what he, uh, Jacob's thinking. Okay, I won't die, and I'll get sex. <laughs> okay, it's a good deal. Okay, so I don't mean, I'm sorry, I should, probably shouldn't say that. But he was a young man. That's the way young men think. I'm going to get a wife. Going to have some. Okay, so this is a good deal. I don't die and I get a wife. Okay? So he's on his way to Canada. He goes 40 miles the first day to Bethel, Luz, the city of Luz. Luz, by the way, I told you what it means. It means crooked or perverse. Crooked or perverse, which is exactly what Jacob was before his encounter with God. It means going in the wrong direction, actually. He goes 40 miles. Here, normal normal um, day's journey was 20 miles. That was normal. So he goes twice as fast. He gets there. He has to camp because the sun's going down. He camps and God meets him. And then he, and he, he makes this commitment. He says, okay, God, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to serve you. He goes and he serves 20 years with his uncle. And then here's what God says to him. Genesis 31, verse 13. I am the God of Bethel, where you anointed the pillar and where you made a vow to me. Now arise, get out of this land, and return to the land of your family. In other words, go back and face your past. How could he do this? On the way back, he tells everybody, y'all go ahead a little bit. I got, I got to stop for a while. And he stops, and he prays, and he has an encounter with God again. And in that encounter, he actually wrestles with God. And why does he wrestle? It's very, very simple. Once he realizes he's God, he says, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Until you change me, God, I am not going to let you go until you change me. And God says, okay, I'll change you. And he touches his hip, and he makes him limp for the rest of his life. Here's what he says to him. From now on, son, you're only going to be able to rely on my strength, not your strength. From now on. And he changes his name to Israel, El meaning God. And many people have translated it Prince of God, which is fine. We are son of the king. 
but it's really not the best translation. It actually means a person who struggles, but God prevails. How many of us does that relate to? <laughs> a person who still struggles, but God prevails. Okay, that's church. Church is a place you can come when you're struggling. And you can make a connection with God. You can have a conversation with him. And because God touches you, you can fulfill your commitment that you make. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And I want you to just take a moment and say, like we do every week, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me? What are you saying to me through this message? We want to pray for you. Doesn't matter if you're a member of Gateway Church, if this is your first time here, or you've been here for 10 years. We want to pray for you. At every campus, if you need prayer for any area of your life, we're going to have one more worship song. We ask that no one leave unless you have an emergency, and we understand that if you do. But we, we, we want to have one worship song. Remember, worship is when we connect with God. So if you need to connect with God in prayer, I want you to come to the front of whichever campus you're attending. Come to one of the leaders. There'll be other people coming. You won't be the only one. And let us pray for you. But if you don't need to come to the front, just take a moment and, and think about what we're singing. Connect with God before you leave. One more time. Just, just make a connection with him. Maybe God will speak something to you about this message. Maybe he's going to say, you're, you're going in the wrong direction. Or you need to turn left or turn right or keep going this way. I know it's tough, but keep going. So as soon as we stand in just a moment, if you need prayer for any area of your life, again, at every campus, you just step out and come forward and let us pray for you. Holy Spirit, I ask you to draw every person at every campus that needs prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. I was 19 years old when I gave my life to the Lord and everything changed. I didn't have any desire to go back to that old life. I wanted to walk with the Lord and learn more about Him. And some people helped me to learn the Bible and to learn how to pray and to learn about my new life in Christ. And that's what we want to do for you. I am so excited that you've given your life to the Lord. He's forgiven all of your sins and you're on your way to heaven. But we need to learn some things now about the Bible, about prayer, about some basics of the Christian life so that you can be victorious and live for the Lord like I know you want to. So we've designed a class called Fresh Start. And I want to encourage you to sign up for this class because we want to help you grow in your walk with the Lord now. I love you and I am so proud of you. We invite you to join us each week on The Blessed Life with Pastor Robert Morris. Experience dynamic Bible-based teaching. Enjoy freedom from the inspiring worship of the Gateway Worship Team. It's a time to grow, be encouraged, and learn how to live the blessed life. The Blessed Life with Gateway Church's Robert Morris.